Mr. Gillespie, your rebuttal, and bear in mind that Republicans face similar accusations in this very case amidst a federal investigation as well. Well, let me be clear. Uh, I'm not talking about accusations. I'm talking about news reports and questions that are out there. Uh, the senator has answered a question here that I don't think is being asked in terms of offering a job. I've not seen any suggestion that uh, he was offering a job, and I understand the difference between the executive branch and the legislative branch in this regard. I've worked in the White House and have worked on uh, the judicial nomination process. I can tell you this, the role a senator plays in the judicial nomination process is a critically important one and a very influential one. And the recommendations that are made have a great weight in terms of what uh, nominations are made. And so I've not seen anyone suggest that there was a, uh, a job offer. Uh, I know there have been talk of private sector jobs with a federal contractor. I think, you know, even that discussion raises questions, legitimate questions. But the notion of a lifetime appointment to the federal bench in relation to a political decision and to further the effort of uh, expanding Obamacare uh, in, in uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, I don't know that those questions have been answered. I think Virginians deserve answers in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Gillespie. Now for our second question, we'll go to Craig Carper from WCVE PBS. He's the WCVE radio political reporter. He'll address the second question, starting with Mr. Warner. Gentlemen, this year the General Assembly reformed the state's SOLs, but there have been no major national reforms since No Child Left Behind. Not all students start each year at the same academic level, amount of background, knowledge, or parental support. A major criticism of the current system from teachers and administrators is that it does not celebrate progress made by struggling students who start from behind. What specific changes would you make to No Child Left Behind? Well, I believe that No Child Left Behind needs to be dramatically reformed or gotten rid of. I think that we've, the pendulum has swung way too far in terms of testing alone. I would argue, though, that one of the things that I've done that I'm proudest of was back when I was governor, and again, with the Republican legislature, we fixed Virginia's budget and made the largest investment in public education in Virginia history, and we need to have that kind of approach. Now, the challenge is going to be is how not only do we reform education, but how do we adequately fund it? What my opponent has not pointed out, and he talks often about easing the squeeze or his commitment to Virginians, but he's already taken one of the most important pledges of this campaign, the, the Grover Norquist Pledge. The Grover Norquist Pledge, which says, in effect, it's better to cut education, it's better to cut our military, it's better to cut support for seniors than to close a single tax loophole. Now, I've dealt with the debt and deficit. It's probably been the issue I've worked on the most. It's hard. No serious person has said, you can't, you've got to look at both sides of the balance sheet. I know about that as a business person. Even Congressman Frank Wolf and Scott Ridgell, Republican members of the Virginia delegation, have said that taking the Grover Norquist pledge is an impediment to tax reform. So you need education reform, but you also need to, form, you need to fund education. And unfortunately, since my opponent has already taken a pledge to Grover Norquist, he's not going to be able to not only reform nor fund education. Mr. Gillespie. Well, this is another debate where Senator Warner has just made a flat-out wrong uh, statement. Uh, I don't sign any pledges. I've not signed pledges. I've not signed the uh, ATR pledge. I've not signed the pledge in terms of... Uh, repealing Obamacare. That said, I have made a pledge to the people of Virginia that I will not vote to raise taxes on the floor of the United States Senate, and I will fight any effort to raise taxes. Senator Warner's already voted to raise taxes by nearly a trillion dollars, and they've been implemented. A lot of taxes that are hitting the middle class and small business owners, and that's hurting our economy. And that's one of the reasons that we have the lowest labor force participation rate in 36 years, and nearly half of all recent college graduates are unable to find uh, full-time quality jobs or unemployed or underemployed. And so uh, I don't believe in raising taxes. I don't sign pledges. I will make a pledge to my fellow Virginians here tonight that I will fight efforts to raise our taxes further than Senator Warner already has. He wants to raise taxes further. I don't. That's one of the big choices in this election. As for his efforts to balance the budget, in the six years he has been there, our debt has gone up seven trillion dollars. Now, we need education reforms, to the original point, and uh, I support education reforms, and if you go to my website, Ed for Senate, you can see my economic growth agenda, EG squared, Ed Gillespie's agenda for economic growth, and point four on that is the need to reform 
education in a way to make our public schools better, more responsive to the needs of students and parents. If you believe in, an, in a society based on equal opportunity, you've got to have quality schools for every child. For rebuttal. Again, let's go back to the pledge he took. I've got the letter from Grover Norquist where it compliments Ed, said you will go above and beyond the pledge. You know, I think we shouldn't vote for anybody who signs. You have a they have a pledge. We will be happy. We will be happy. We will be happy to give you. We will be happy to give you Grover Norquist complimenting you on taking the pledge and going above and beyond the pledge. Now let's <laughs> let's go back to what the effects of that are. The effects of that taking the pledge is that you end up saying it's better to cut education. It's better to cut our military. It's better to cut senior services rather than closing a single tax loophole. It's in effect saying you want to hire someone to go into fiscal debates with one hand tied behind their back. No serious group who's looked at our fiscal issues, and I've taken arrows from both the left and the right, and occasionally even AARP on some of my efforts on entitlement reform, have said you've got to look at both sides of the balance sheet. What I did as governor, what I've been fighting for in the United States Senate, again, there is a clear choice between the two candidates on this issue. All right, thank you, Mr. Warner. We're going to go to our third question now. The president of AARP Virginia, Bob Lancato, will address his question to Mr. Gillespie. Gentlemen, Social Security turns 80 next year, and as you know, it is the foundation upon which older Americans rely for their retirement. In fact, Social Security provides 50 percent or more of family income for almost half of all older Americans. How will you protect Social Security for today's seniors and strengthen it for future generations? Well, we have to start with the point you just made, which is we must protect Social Security for today's seniors and not only those in retirement but near retirement as well. And then we have to save it for future generations. My son and daughter are here with me this evening. It's not going to be there for them. And in fact, if you're 47 years old or younger, you're looking at, at your retirement point uh, having a getting 70 cents on the dollar of projected benefits because of the insolvency that is looming. And so we need to save Social Security and Medicare for future generations so it's there for them. Unfortunately, Senator Warner voted to raid Medicare of over $700 billion, siphoned it off into a new entitlement program called the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Didn't extend the life of the program at all. We need to take a serious look at what do we need to do to reform these programs so that they will be saved for future generations. And that entails a number of things that would have to get bipartisan support. And I think things looking at the measure of inflation that adjusts benefits is important. I think looking at uh, retirement ages, we're already in the process of, of increasing the retirement age uh, to, to 67. Uh, but I think we need to look at other op options here uh, in terms of reform so that our, our children and their children will have the same benefit of a secure social safety net in their retirement that my parents have had and that I will have at my age. It's going to be there for me, but not many people who are a little bit younger than me, uh, they're going to be at risk of 70 cents on the dollar of projected benefits. Mr. Warner? I agree that Social Security is one of the most important programs our federal government has ever put in place, and we've got to make sure the promise of it is still there. The challenge is the math doesn't work anymore. When I was a kid, there were 16 people working for every one person on retirement. Today, there are three people working for every one person on retirement. We've got to make some changes. Unlike my opponent, and I've taken arrows from both the left and the right on this, I've laid out some specific changes that I think ought to be considered. Change CPI. The idea that those folks under 35, and I've talked to lots of them all the time, if they would be willing to wait an extra year to get Social Security, if it would be there. Recognizing that maybe folks like Ed and I have been blessed to do well, maybe we ought to raise the cap in terms of how much is taxed in terms of income. And I've also said that for those people who are 80 and above, we actually ought to increase the benefit because they're outliving their savings. My opponent, though, has a very different approach on Social Security. He was the major cheerleader for the Bush-Cheney plan to privatize Social Security. Think if that had become legislation in the midst of the financial crisis. It would have been devastation for literally millions of American seniors. Now, you would have thought after that financial crisis, he would no longer be an advocate for privatizing Social Security. But just last year, he wrote an editorial saying it was good for the country and good for the Republican Party, again, this same notion of everything Republican Democrat, if the Bush privatization plan would have been put into law. I strongly disagree with that. We've got to strengthen Social Security, make sure it's still there, not privatize it. 